Our scripture passage this morning comes from Philippians 4, 4 through 7, and we will be reading from the New International Version. Rejoice in the Lord, always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. In, my, in one of my favorite Christmas movies of the season, the movie Elf, the main character, an orphan raised at the North Pole, a uh, human but raised as an elf at the North Pole, lives by and l- learns and lives by a code, a motto that says, among other things, the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. Now, if you've seen the movie, uh, you, then you know that it isn't just the idea of singing loud for all to hear that works in the scope of things to bring cheer, but the way his life affects others, the sheer joy for life that he has, the joie de vivre, as the French say, that the main character has, it's infectious. It's inspiring, and it transforms, even in the movie, grumpy people into generous, loving ones. Joy can do that. A joy-filled life can be infectious, inspiring, and transforming as well. When you have joy, it can be revolutionary. But trying to find joy in the times in which we live isn't always easy, is it? Or in any time of waiting, hardship and trials. Waiting is hard. Waiting for good news is even harder. Waiting for everything to be all as it should be to create that perfect environment for peace and joy even more difficult. If I could repeat a phrase I used last week and combine it with one I have spoken before on the topic of joy many times, too many times to to count, to help shape our direction this morning, it would be this. Just as we looked at last week, just as peace doesn't depend on our circumstances being tranquil, still, calm, and perfect to enjoy God's peace... In the same way, joy doesn't depend on our circumstances to be perfect either. Joy comes when we encounter the Lord amidst our circumstances, whatever they may be. Joy places our trust and dependence on Jesus, whose birth we anticipate in Advent and celebrate at Christmas. While society often defines joy as that feeling we get when we have great happiness or great pleasure, uh, an emotion of life because the sun is shining, because uh, our favorite sports team is, is winning, or we get a raise or a promotion at work, or the kids are actually listening to us, or, or because we, we encountered a grown man dressed as an elf singing loud for all to hear... When joy is that only that and only that as a definition, it falls short when it comes to the laments of life, the heartbreak and tragedy we face, the poor health, the difficulty, the strife. I'm not saying that, okay, 
folks, just because you have those things doesn't mean you, you, you're going to lament. You're going to have to sing loud for all to hear whenever, whenever you encounter those moments because I don't think I'm going to hear you say, Oh joy, another new set of pandemic restrictions. Oh joy, I get to wear my mask even more often. Or, oh joy, another rainstorm is coming our way. Oh joy, I just received terrible news from my doctor. That's why I say joy does not depend on our circumstances. But joy comes when we encounter the Lord amidst our circumstances because we can be joy-filled despite the masks, the weather, and even bleak news. We can still be infectious and inspiring people and transform the hearts and lives of those around us when we face life, all of life, the good, the bad, and the ugly with the joy of the Lord as our strength. Sometimes that joy will be witnessed in those exuberant displays because our circumstances will create that feeling. And sometimes it will be seen just in the brave, serene, confident way we face life's difficulties that shows our trust and dependence is on Jesus to bring us our joy not our circumstances. Paul models that here in the book of Philippians. It may not be the go-to passage you'd think of in terms of Advent, but it is one of the ones, one of the uh, readings that the, the lectionary does recommend. And really, I think it is actually a perfect place for the Sunday that celebrates and, and recognizes joy as part of the Advent journey. As we've looked at before, the letter to the church in Philippi was consumed with this message of joy. It takes us deep into the world of a joy-filled life. Paul himself writing from prison to express such joy, giving us a chance to see that despite our own personal difficulties, the gospel always advances. Despite who you are or what you might think your pedigree is, God must and can transform your life. Philippians teaches us many things. It teaches us humility and perseverance and right thinking and that we can shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. And it teaches us about true joy, where it comes from, what it looks like, and why we can be filled with joy no matter what life throws at us. It teaches us that joy depends on a deepening relationship with the Lord and the resolve really to keep our attitude and our focus on Jesus. In fact, it's the hard attitude that shapes the way we live because when our hearts are full of joy, then we inspire, then we impact, then we infect in a good way and transform others around us because joy is contagious and we need to develop that attitude of joy, one that is naturally part of who we are at all times. In that sense is, is how I identify with the movie Elf's motto of the best way to spread Christmas cheer. Uh, the best way to show uh, the world Jesus is to show them joy-filled lives. Notice how our, our passage opens. It's those familiar words, rejoice in the Lord always. And then it's as if Paul um, says, you know what? In case you didn't get it the first time, I will say it again. Rejoice. Have joy. Be filled with joy at all times. It's a tall order, isn't it? Let's be honest, that's a tall order. As I said, it's not always easy to find joy, especially in the hard circumstances that we face, like the, the ones in which we currently live. So how do we do that? How do we find joy? Maybe we reorient our perspective on the topic this morning. And even the very familiar words of Philippians 4, 4 to 7. 
There's a lot of great stuff in this passage we could talk about. Rejoice always. We could focus the entire thing on just that. Let your gentleness be evident to all. That's, that's powerful. Don't be anxious. Instead, by, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Praying. Uh, we could talk about that for a while. And just the idea of the, God's peace guarding our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. We could talk about that. We could focus on that this Sunday. But maybe, just maybe, this Advent, we just we look at this passage and reorient our perspective on the few little words that we find at the end of verse 5. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. As Stan Mast writes, he says, in the words of Philippians 4, 5, we have a Reader's Digest summary of the Advent gospel. The Lord is near. Paul uses just those few simple words, that, but simple but profound and rich and deep with meaning, especially in a world where God seems absent at times or the future seems just to stretch hopelessly before us. We've become numb, perhaps, to the message of joy because we don't always see where God is at work. And we wonder, and we try and force attitudes of joy upon ourselves. We're numb, though, at times when we hear someone say, jo- have joy, be joyful, rejoice. So reorient for just a moment. The Lord is near. He is at hand. The world desperately needs to hear this simple yet profound summary. When Paul writes this little, as Master calls it, Advent Gospel Summary, the Reader's Digest version, Reader's Digest version is always like a, a shorter, simpler version of things. He is saying, he is saying this, he is writing this to a church that is facing adversity. He's saying, whatever you're suffering right now, whatever your grief you're experiencing, even the grief you're experiencing on my behalf, whatever worries you have, whatever fear you have for your own future, remember this. The king is here. The real king is near. Your citizenship is not of this world. When he says this to the church in Philippi, the Lord is near, it enables him then to continue on saying, Because the Lord is near, then you don't have to be anxious. You don't have to worry about things. You may not feel at peace, but peace is available because the Lord is near. Now you might think, oh, that's easy for you to say. You're the Apostle Paul, one of the giants of the faith. Remember, Paul is writing this from prison. Again, I don't think Paul is saying, oh joy, I'm in prison. He has cause, every reason to be anxious, to be worried, but he's not. Yes, he has a concern for the church. He warns them of the evildoers and naysayers in in chapter 3, verse 2. He tells them your faith is going to be tested. You will suffer as I have suffered, but when, you, when, when that comes upon you, he says, think and act like Jesus who stood in solidarity with the oppressed by taking the form of a servant. Chapter 2, verse 7, Jesus dies on the cross. Yes, the powers that be killed him, but a far greater power exalted him, raised him, and gave him the name which is above every name, Paul says. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the God Paul trusts. This is the God he serves. This is the God, he says to the Philippians, that you trust and you serve. This is the reason you can rejoice. This is the reason we can rejoice today. The Lord is near. He is with us. As Mast writes, if we believe that phrase, the the Lord is near, then we will be able to rejoice always. 
then we will be able to have joy filled lives. We're called to rejoice in this passage, not in the circumstances in our lives, but in the Lord. Your circumstances at times will bring a lot of joy, but at times it will be tough. I mean, really tough. But you can still rejoice in the Lord. That's what Paul insists upon, because the Lord is near rejoice always. Again, I, I, I just, I, and I don't want to downplay people's experience or, or personal hurts or grief or sadness or whatever you might be going through. I'm not saying that, you know, you're going to have to leave this place and, and only and always sing, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Thank you. We didn't practice that at home, by the way, honestly. <laughs> I was really hoping someone would say where. <laughs> unless, unless, unless in the moment that it, that it feels darkest, singing that song lifts your spirits again, then go for it. Do it. And sing it loud for all to hear, for, as, for that matter. Joy is, a, joy is the attitude of the heart. It's all about the heart attitude. Uh, uh, one commentator, William Henderson, uh, suggests Paul could rejoice uh, in Jesus for a number of reasons, all of which are listed in this letter as well as in his other letters. He could rejoice because he knew that he was sa- a, a saved individual whose purpose was in his entirety to magnify Christ. That this Savior in whose cross, crown, and coming again he glories was able to supply his every need. He could rejoice because others too were being saved and that the apostle himself was being used by God for this glorious purpose. He could rejoice because he had many friends and helpers, co-laborers in the gospel cause who together formed a glorious fellowship in the Lord. He could rejoice because God was causing all things, even his prison chains, to work together for the good of all of God's people, and that at at all times, not just some of the time, but at all times, he has the freedom of access to the throne of grace. Paul looked upon his circumstances as God-given opportunities to advance the gospel because he had great faith believing the words he writes himself, the Lord is near. He rejoiced even when things weren't going well by human standards. He had the long view in mind. I admit, sometimes I don't have the long view in mind, and I know I'm not alone. Sometimes we have the short view in mind only. We forget to have the long view. And so in the short view, we we tend to gripe and complain and worry more often. But Paul had the long view in mind. He didn't complain about what God uh, wasn't doing in his life, but rather he looked forward to what God was doing, was going to do, and could do in and through his life because he was confident the Lord is near. This is the good news that gives us great joy. The Savior we celebrate each Christmas, of whom the angel made that proclamation, good news of great joy for all the people, is that He is near. He is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. In, in, the, um, in the paraphrase, uh, that, that the message puts together of John chapter 1, verse 14. You know, when the Word became flesh, it says He moved into the neighborhood, pitching His tent right next door. Remember last week, we talked about that, that imagery of, of, of being visited by Jesus. And the idea of visitation, one of, the, one of the translations is to tent upon. And that's what Jesus did. He made His, his dwelling among us. He moved into the neighborhood. The angel tells the good news to a skeptical Joseph who thinks that the child his betrothed is carrying is some other guy's, that she has been unfaithful to him. So the angel says to him, do not fear, this is in fact Emmanuel, God with us. And even when Jesus uh, ascended to heaven uh, and goes back to, to his father, his parting words are, I am with you. Always. Just like at the beginning, rejoice in the Lord. Sometime? Every now and then? Only if it feels good? No. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. Why? Because Jesus says, I am with you always. He is near. Ephesians 3, 17 says that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. That's how near. That's how near Jesus is. And this, this that simple little phrase, this Advent gospel summary, for lack of a better description, is essential for us to get a hold of and, and, and wrestle with. Instead of, of worrying, oh, am I rejoicing always? Is my gentleness evident? Am I praying? Um, do I really experience God's peace? Because you know, I think we wrestle with a lot of those practical, mechanical things of the faith. Sometimes I think we need to step away from those for just a moment and see statements like the Lord is near and wrestle with it. And it's an important thing, by the way, this, this phrase, the Lord is near, because, because remember, sin separates us from God. A chasm, a gulf opens up between us and God because we are at enmity with God. When Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, all humanity was cursed by this curse of sin, separated from God by sin. But in Jesus, God has come close. He is near. He is with us. And he is near in time as well. We don't always gauge time the same way that the Lord, you know, with Scripture even says that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day to show the difference between how we might both gauge the sense of time. But there is a sense in which as we are summoned to rejoice, that it's because the Lord is also near in time. We, as I often say, in Advent, the season of Advent, we live in the in-between times, between the time he came, the Advent that we celebrate, the Christmas event, the first arrival or first coming of the Lord, and we look forward to the time he will come again, and that time is near. Again, we don't gauge time the same way the Lord does, but we have this view in mind. He is near. And as I said, if we believe the Lord is near, then we can rejoice always. We can let our gentleness be evident to all. We can be free of anxiety and worry and fear. We can boldly pray. We can have a peace that passes all understanding to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We can be the kind of people that inspire, that engage, encourage, that transform others by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord is near. We can rejoice, and we can have peace. I love the fact that this passage connects the two in a way that is inseparable. Because the Lord is near, we can rejoice and have peace. And that's so important. Do you remember this? You probably do, but I'll say it anyway. Do you remember the, the first words that Jesus spoke to his disciples following his resurrection? There they were behind locked doors, afraid, fearful. They think Jesus, our, our, sa- our Lord, is dead. Uh, the Romans are going to come and get us. Uh, you know, we're in trouble. They're fearful for their own lives. And, and, and just suddenly, Jesus appears in the room with them. He doesn't chastise them for the locked doors. He doesn't chastise them for their fear. He doesn't question their loyalty. He doesn't berate them for being afraid. He doesn't say, where were you when I really needed you and give them that kind of a guilt-laden speech. His first words were simply, peace be with you. The very thing they needed that they didn't have in that moment was the very first thing he offered, peace. And he still offers it today. Don't let the darkness of this world and its circumstances steal your joy and keep you from that peace. Stare it in the eye. Stare it down and rejoice anyway. Maybe sing, I got the joy. joy." I, I know, that's up to you. Now, again, in saying all this, 
no way am I diminishing the difficult times. They're going to come along too. Uh, I love what Carla Works says. She says, rejoicing does not negate or turn a blind eye to despair. Rejoicing does not somehow make the suffering go away or minimize the injustice. Rather, rejoicing acknowledges that we are serving the one and only God who can rectify the wrongs, who can and has stood in solidarity with those who are oppressed. Rejoicing in the face of, uh, of injustice is a, is a courageous act. A theological hope lived out in the present that stems, as works goes on to say, from a vision of God's shalom, a shalom so glorious that it is transforming and claiming life even in the present. Rejoicing acknowledges that despite our circumstances, we boldly proclaim in faith, I know the Lord is near. He is with us. Emmanuel. Evil, darkness, depression, anxiety, uncertainty, none of that gets to have the last word in your life. None of that. The Advent gospel whispers softly and confidently the answer, no, the Lord is near. Yes, waiting is hard. Yes, life's current circumstances are overwhelming, is overwhelming at times. But our joy doesn't depend on our circumstances being perfect. Our joy depends on Jesus. Joy places our trust and dependence on Him, on the Lord, on Jesus, whose birth we anticipate in Advent and celebrate at Christmas. So praise be to God. Because the Lord is near. Amen.